This is part two of our ongoing UFO series. UFOs are real burgeoning and not going away. The first film is right here on YouTube and it's for free. So you can check that out. The second film, which you're about to see, is also free on YouTube. All I would ask is that you pass it forward. Folks, we are, <laughs> it's coming down so fast that it's hard for me to keep up with it, seriously. And we are now on the sixth rung of the disclosure ladder. And I'll get into that a little bit later in the film. You'll see that. First off, we interview Francisco Carrera. Francisco was our guide in Portugal. And then, of course, later on, when we toured all through Europe, uh, looking and filming at megalithic sites. Uh, Francisco is head of exopolitics in, in Portugal. What he brings to the table in this one-on-one -on -one interview, which happened a couple of years ago, is I, an insight few people gain unless they're immersed in the phenomena, and Francisco is such a person. Our second uh, mainstay in the film is Preston Dennett. Preston Dennett is an author, researcher, perhaps best known for his work UFOs over Topanga Canyon, groundbreaking material. Topanga Canyon is about a half an hour from where I'm sitting right now. There was an unbelievable flap right over Topanga Canyon. I remember one story where the entire car was lifted off the ground. We've heard all this before. Folks, UFOs are real, burgeoning, not going away. This is the coming great deception. This is part two. All I would ask once again is that you pass it forward. In 1947, we go to the Roswell crash, which allegedly happened, and, and it's funny how the military has written uh, about every 10 years they write, you know, Roswell case closed, and you know, the weather balloon and crash test dummies, and they constantly are, are kind of reworking their, their script because they know it's bogus. I think they know it's bogus. But, you know, Stanton Friedman brought that to light as well as others. I remember sitting down with Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr., who was a small boy around 11 or 12 at the time, when all this happened and uh, he told me his father came in with a box and, and of, of parts, wreckage, debris and set it on the kitchen table and told, woke up his mother and himself, Jesse Marcel Jr., took them down, showed them this and said, what you're seeing you may never see again. This is from a craft from another world. He never backed off his story till his death. Uh, Marcel's were ridiculed. When I sat down with Jesse Marcel Jr., um, we, we had a, I was a one-on-one -on -one interview, but then I wrote a series of questions which he replied to, you know, by computer, and that's, that serves as the basis um, for the interview. So, you know, Roswell has been, to some people, like the Holy Grail. To others, it's, it was a weather balloon. What say you? Well, weather balloon, I think that's... <laughs> um, that's, that's nonsense. You know, like, it was the... Uh, 109, uh, 509 cavalry. Uh, they were highly trained, highly officers, trained, highly trained officers. They had a high clearance. Uh, they dealt with the experience of the H bomb, the, the atomic bomb. They were the ones that deployed the uh, the tests for the atomic bomb. So, and they would send uh, weather balloons every day, almost every day. So they knew. What a weather balloon looks like. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the crash test dummies also, Stanton Friedman talked about it in the sense that they only were uh, invented or put into practice in 53. So 47 is still a long Unless way. Unless they had a time machine. Exactly. The crash test dummies uh, are not going to work. So uh, <laughs> that any idea, any rebuke, it's it's nothing. And why, why would high uh, patent uh, military generals um, would be so worried about what happened. Huh? I mean, if it was a weather balloon, why, why, keep, why keep writing a new book yeah, every exactly. five or ten years or something? Exactly, but uh, why bother high-ranking generals to I mean, just call it's a, it's a weather balloon? Okay, yeah. there, would, there would be teams uh, that would deal with it and that's it. Well, having all those people 
worry about it? Yes, it doesn't strange. make any sense. No, this woman came up to us at a conference and told us that her father was ex-Navy SEAL, in fact, was one of the early SEAL teams, whatever. And, you know, it's a type of a story which you can't vet, obviously. He won't come on the record because of clearances and all this other stuff. But apparently he told her the story. Uh, they had just got back from a mission and they were dispatched to an area in the Four Corners region where um, Crash Disc was. And when they got there, they were led to the disc. They peered into it. There were dead alien bodies within the craft. And then they set up a perimeter and the retrieval came in and all this stuff. Uh, so Jackie Gleason makes a statement that he actually viewed dead aliens. This statement is what, 55 years ago, something like that. So it's in, it's in maybe the mid 60s, whatever. Uh, the bottom line is this. Is he lying or telling the truth? With everything that we know, I believe that Gleason's statement is absolutely 100% factual. How do I know this? Gleason and Nixon were pals. And I believe that Nixon showed Gleason what was really going on because Gleason had an interest in UFOs. He saw them. So look folks, a statement like this that happens decades ago and now our government is telling us that they have in their possession off-world vehicles. So the bottom line is this. Our government has deliberately obfuscated the truth for decades and decades, for year after year after year, with bogus books like Roswell, Case Closed. They just make stuff up. Roswell will never be closed until they actually pony up and show us the actual crash wreckage from the Roswell site and the video that they took. We know that the, all that exists, and maybe, maybe that's another rung on the disclosure ladder. Uh, I'm gonna jump forward because all this is in the past. I'm going to jump forward to what uh, Luis Elizondo said on Tucker Carlson just a short while back. And Tucker asked, and to me it was a staged question. It was set up because, you know, Elizondo feigns this like, well, I can't do that nonsense. Of course you can do it. That's why you're there. I think he's one of the guys that is sort of bringing about disclosure to the people at large. But Tucker Carlson asked Luis Elizondo, does the United States government have debris who crash UFOs? And Elizondo replies, yes. But, but quickly sum it up for us. Why do you think this material might be connected to UFOs? Well, I, without getting to a lot of detail right now, because it's, 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 frankly, it's too speculative for me at this point to say why I think something. At the end of the day, it's going to be what the analysis tells us. And if you right. have, for example, interesting isotopic ratios that are not normally found, let's say, on this planet, then you have to scratch your head and either A, it's been engineered that way, or B, it came from somewhere else. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to find out. So these are materials brought to you by people who say this is at the site of a UFO incident or a crash? In some cases, yes. Uh, again, I, unfortunately, I can't elaborate too much with some of these individuals. We do have right. non-disclosure agreements, but uh, it's from, from various sources, both private and, and governmental. It goes without saying, I, I hope that you'll come back uh, as you get to the bottom of this. We remain skeptical but open-minded on this and all things. Luis, great to see yes, you sir, there. Thank, thank you, you so much. Me. That's what it's stated, off-world vehicles. And that ties into Bob Lazar, which goes way back to Area 51 and in the 90s, and he was scoffed at and laughed at. I remember showing the video to my family. Well, that's interesting, but you know, we have no really no proof. And yet now it, it, it's off world vehicles in their possession. Bob Lazar, Area 51, the sports model. What do you think? Yeah, yeah I've always supported Bob Lazar. I have too. Uh, because he's not the only guy. Yeah. He, he was the front man, sort of. Uh, but I've talked to George Knapp, who really did the research with Lazar, and uh, very sincere. Very much so, and very truthful. I mean, they're not, you, you can tell by their, and, and you know, you've done, done enough interviews, their body language, where they look at you in the eye, the whole thing, that they're, whatever they're saying, they believe it's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and there were so many other whistleblowers saying the same exact thing talk to experiencers, people who have been inside these crafts. Right. And one guy I remember distinctly, he had you know, a bunch of experiences in his home in Utah, said what he saw was exactly what Bob Lazar described. Wow. And that's how he knew Bob Lazar was real, because the craft that he was taking on board was exactly um, described what Bob Lazar said. 
I thought that was interesting. Very I've heard, interesting. Heard that before. Right. Uh, and yeah, I think he's absolutely uh, right about it, and I'm glad to see him finally being vindicated. Uh, and I think we're going to see more. What amazes me about this is on national TV, he's, he sort of spills the beans and says, yes, they have debris and crash UFOs in their possession, and the American people, nobody cares. It's like flatline. I, f I figured, well, that's it, my phone's gonna start ringing, people will email me. I mean, I had some people email me, a couple of people call, but it's not like this avalanche of, oh my gosh, what's going on? No, uh, mainstream doesn't no, care. They don't care? Uh, only the, the fanatics. Luis Elizondo stating that the United States had in its possession wreckage from crashed UFOs. Now, you're yeah. a researcher, I'm a researcher. I believe Roswell was not a weather balloon, especially after interviewing Dr. Jesse Marcel Jr. Your thoughts? Yeah, I also yeah. talked to Marcel uh, shortly before he passed away. Right, same here. And uh, he was very convincing. Very convincing. And, uh, I've got all the books on Roswell, not all, because there's like 50. <laughs> Um, seriously, that is the main event, and I'm absolutely convinced that it was a valid event, not a weather balloon. And uh, it was really interesting to see the Air Force try to backpedal around the bodies. You know, so they said they're dummies, but they were no dummies at that time. In 47, no crash, and that thanks the late Dr. Freeman, you know, proved that. Right. Yeah, they did the research on that. Oops, small so, details. So yeah, the whole Roswell case is huge, and to hear the Pentagon saying, Using that term, otherworldly vehicles, was really. Where do you think the next step is? Where do you think the next? I, I'm worried about the next step. The next rung on the ladder, as it were. Yeah, because clearly um, the narrative is about the threat, not the potential threat, a threat. Okay, so everything is set to be responding to a threat. It's. Uh, they are giving examples of um, uh, like uh, in Italy where this UFO took uh, down a, a helicopter, for example, uh, as a threat. Um, also, um, a village that suffered uh, some burning in the house, like much in the Brazil in the yeah, 1970s. Right. And so again, it's a, a threat. The idea of uh, the, the pilots don't know how to address or um, behave in the presence of those highly advanced vehicles uh, also considered. I, I, I know you've seen the clip, I've seen the clip, I've, I forget the date, but it's, it's, it's an older clip. They're firing an intercontinental ballistic missile. Yeah, that's in, in, um, in 64. And it's in the States. In the States. So this thing is moving, all yeah, of a sudden you get a UFO going like this. Around that, the chief, that it was, that's just unbelievable. That was um, Captain, I guess it was Captain Robert Jacobs. Uh, he was um, uh, the head of that. Um, uh, he's a PhD, he's a professor. Uh, he was uh, ordered to film the launch of a, a missile um, with, a, with a nuclear right. uh, warhead. warhead. To it, right. And they filmed it all through all the steps. And the next day, but he couldn't, with his naked eye, couldn't see the, all the, the ultimate uh, part of the atmosphere. Next day, he was ordered to be uh, to address uh, uh, the commander in the in the base, and they put the, the clip on. And what we see, uh, what what he described, was the the missile going that like up, and there comes a UFO, and this is all traveling at thousands of miles per hour. And it shows up here, it um, sets a, a beam to the warhead here, here, but always like this, and the missile goes down. Yeah, and he said he was asked not to talk about it in any way, and uh, like it never happened. And some two guys with civilian clothes took the film and, and, and left the room. Left the you know, we hear this over and over and over again, it just, it seems like and we've talked about this off the record, it almost seems like the old guard that that were alive in the days of Roswell and, and maybe their, their direct underlings that were coming up through the ranks, all those people are gone. They're no longer in charge or many of those people were gone. Yeah, well, they were, they, they, they had strict um, rules. Right. Uh, they had the but those rules are changing. Right. 
Yeah, eventually, well, th this, this has a set, like 20 years, 25 years, so when it's time they started talking, uh, some, most of them, and eventually they know that, well, they are no longer inactive, so they will be less confronted with their colleagues. Uh, same thing happens in, in, in Portugal, uh, I guess. Um, but it's, it's interesting that in Portugal is completely, it's like a different reality. Uh, you see in the States there's the core of cover-up, mm -hmm. uh, even my colleague Robert Fleischer in Germany, there's, it's like taboo, you don't talk about it. Um, he knew at a certain point that uh, the, the government, the Bundestag, the parliament, German parliament, mm -hmm. had uh, a study about UFOs. He asked for, uh, through the, the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, uh, access to the study, they said there was no study, uh, <laughs> nothing else, no, nothing happened. So he knew there was a, a part of the Bundestag that really had access to that to that file. So he asked again permission. He, they went to court. Um, the, um, they argued that the, the that department of the Bundestag was not um, could not be subpoenaed by a, a FOIA. Okay. Uh, they went to a higher court, they won, mm. uh, but they are still waiting for yeah. new developments. Good, good luck with that. Yeah. Still get something again, that's all redacted. It's, it's exactly. And in Portugal, you had not that much cases because we were not a war, we don't have war, uh, atomic warheads, we don't have uh, atomic bases, nuclear bases. But uh, there are a few cases, very interesting, full of details, and you have the, the pilots coming uh, even to TV and talking about it. And especially two former chief of staff of the Air Force. This is, was conducted by the Air Force in 1982. Uh, the three pilots that saw the object, this, this type of object that played with the planes, and they performed, they did a uh, very profound study about what they may, may have seen, and this is signed by the three pilots. Uh, well, why the discrepancy? Go, go back to why? What's, what am I looking yeah, at? Yeah, because they wanted to know exactly the proportions of oh, the Oh, I see, okay. okay. Which ones did the pilot show? Pick. Um, here, here, and this one they said it was smaller. And this guy was the only guy that never wanted to be on camera. Wow. This is another, another case where the, the, the pilot almost he lost the control of the plane. When he, the, the UFO was here, he panicked, the UFO and his plane stopped working and fell. And he tried everything to get grab of the, the airplane again and he eventually was able to. This is a report from the Air Force. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel. He's, this man was also a uh, NATO base commander in Portugal. The bottom line is that too many people are are seeing, I mean, it's just too many case after case after case. I mean, something's going on. This is a video that was shot several years ago in Michigan. The gentleman, uh, first hand, first hand information. We know that the flap took place. This is close encounters of a second kind as the craft was very, very close to, to the ground. Um, multiple witnesses saw this. So we keep getting stories like this. It's incredible. But we also, when this was, when I actually filmed this, uh, we had not had the first rung of a disclosure ladder. In other words, Commander David Favor had not appeared yet on Tucker Carlson show claiming that whatever he saw was not of this earth. That, of course, happened in December of 2017. This clip comes from a few years earlier than that. And yet what we see and what we hear from the witness is that this UFO was up close and personal right over the Miami International Airport. Here's his testimony. Okay, so I came to work one day. I worked at, D at Miami International airport as an air traffic controller. I was a radar controller there at that time. And I came to work on an 11 to 7 shift, which means I came to work at 10.30 in the morning. And when I walked in the facility, 
the place was buzzing, like some, something had happened. I thought maybe somebody had died, but I said, so what happened? What, what's going on? They said, ah, the midnight guys saw a UFO. I said, you're kidding. So I said, well, who was it that was on duty? So they told me, and uh, well, obviously he was gone because he had worked the midnight shift, so I was gonna have to wait a few days to talk to this guy. When he came in, he did not want to talk about it. He was clearly spooked out of his mind. I mean, he was spooked. So I let it go. He said he wasn't gonna talk, so I let it go. So about two weeks go by, and I came in to work at the position, and I was assigned the Fort Lauderdale sector, and he, this fellow was down there too, and it was just he and I, and there was like nobody around us for about 30 feet. So we were working, and uh, he looked over at me. I could tell he was thinking. And so he goes, he does the classic look around to make sure nobody's listening. He goes, okay, I'll tell you. He says, it was about six o'clock in the morning, somewhere after six, it was still dark. And um, <clears throat> I was getting ready to go home at 6.30. The, my replacement came up early to make the coffee and there was an air traffic assistant up there too. So there was three of us sitting up there in the tower. And so the, uh, the fellow made the coffee and he walked over to the north side of the tower and he looked and he could see all the lights, but as he looked across the horizon, something was covering up the lights and it was moving towards the facility. So he looks up at the radar and sure enough, here comes this huge target across the scope. Now, the tower radars only have a 20 mile range, so when they're moving fast, they really ka-chunk, 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 come across it. And, they, and he didn't even get the words out of his mouth, what is that, when the thing was right over the airport. Really low altitude, at the same altitude as the tower, so about 180 feet. And he went, oh my gosh! And so everybody, of course, they look at this and they're all staring at this thing. It's huge. All right. So it's right over the midfield terminal, which is where all the commuter traffic were sitting. And there was some poor schmuck in a maintenance vehicle out there sleeping in his vehicle. This thing stopped, turned its light on, like just out of close encounters. And this truck is bathed in light. This guy freaks out and he's, they all have ground control frequencies in their vehicles so they can cross runways and he starts swearing on the frequency. What are you guys doing? I hate when you guys, because controllers like to play jokes sometimes, they use the light gun, but this was no light gun <laughs> and it wasn't a controller. And all of a sudden he realizes it's not the control tower, so he looks up and he's just freaked. He just quits talking completely. So, it, I, so I asked, I said, well, how long was it, you know, the light on for? He said, two or three minutes. Now, it was, dark to dusk and it's getting lighter and lighter as this goes on. So this thing had been over the airport for a while. So at this point here, I stopped him. I said, so, all right, tell me how big was this thing and what was its shape? He said, all right, Paul, it was the size of a 727. And it was like one of those flying wing shapes, almost like a boomerang. I said, what color was it? He said, it was like a dark gray green. He goes, so it shut its light off and it just sat there for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden it went straight up, straight up. And it just so happened that there was an Eastern airliner coming in from the islands down from the south. Well, this thing went right by his wing. The pilot was really surprised. He swore on the frequency, which is something they never do. And that was the radar controller was working him. He said, what are you guys doing down there or up there? And they said, you're not gonna believe it. <laughs> and so the airliner keeps going and he goes out and he comes back in and he's starting to land his landing procedure. Well, this airplane, this UFO has gone straight up over the airport, probably about 20,000 feet and stops again. Now this time, as it started to go up, there was a controller that worked, that was gonna work the day shift and a supervisor that was gonna work the day shift. The controller was coming in from the north, he lived in my subdivision, and the supervisor was coming in from the south, they both saw it go up. So there's two more witnesses there, plus the pilots, and anybody that was on the eastern, that side of the eastern airplane that was awake, saw it also. So the thing stops and it starts to turn on lights. 
red, green, white, and it starts to tumble, just tumble. And so you can see these lights just gyrating. And so it did that for a couple minutes, and then it settled down, stopped, and went right out of the atmosphere. You know, there's a lot of um, a lot of still shots, a lot of videos, there's a lot of hoaxes on YouTube and other places, and, and you can spot them fairly easily. One of my favorite um, ones, which I believe is real, we showed on Fox News. The sky's up about 35, 37,000 feet in a jet airline. I'm sure you've seen it. And he's just kind of filming with his iPhone outside the window of the jet airliner. All of a sudden, this, this thing just kind of comes up through the clouds and then levels itself and, and everybody's going oh my gosh what's that so it's um this cat and mouse game we talked about this with Hugh Newman this cat and mouse game has gone on literally for decades and I'll just spill the beans the way the way I look at this is from a, a biblical prophetic narrative what I mean by that the Bible is true it's not the source of all truth it doesn't have you know uh, breaking down what the DNA code is but it is a source of truth I believe it, 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 it's the ultimate source of truth. Um, so there's one scripture, prophetic scripture, which I find really interesting, which is in a book called Thessalonians. And it basically says, um, because they, and this is future, this is written 2000 years ago, pointing towards the latter days, because they did not believe the truth, God sends them strong delusion. And so the first question we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the truth? What is, what is this truth that, that the Bible is referring to? In my opinion, it's the fact that, that Jesus Christ created everything. He spoke everything into existence. That's what, that's what scripture tells us, which goes against the prevailing paradigm in both academia and the scientific community of Darwinism says no 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 all this just just evolved over millions or billions of years there is no god there is no supernatural it just it's all evolution and all this religious stuff is just mythos but it's interesting how that scripture pinpoints with with, with great accuracy in my opinion exactly where we are now some people will say well you're reading into that la and maybe i am but the question is the second question would be now that we know that they've abandoned the truth because they did not believe the truth. God sends them strong delusion. There's a term I've used called the coming great deception. And this is kind of a long-winded question, but I have to set it up so you can respond to it. The neo-Darwinists are looking out there. They believe in the idea of panspermia, that we were seated here by a race of advanced extraterrestrials. So, if this is a deception, if it's a supernatural um, phenomenon that we're seeing, then it, and it fits the biblical narrative perfectly. If they really are from, from some other planet, then it doesn't, per se. I, you know, I'm just saying. But if, if it's supernatural, then it's... What are your thoughts? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, do we have the same source or not? Uh, if there are different sources, if, if, this, if this is the same source, um, when you say the same the, source, the same please. source that's um, sending these entities. Okay, so, okay. all right. Assuming different, right. different, different shapes, shapes right. etc. Which is what I believe. Uh, the other yep, hypothesis is that there's really something um, different. Panspermia is not necessarily. Uh, the seed of life through, ex through extraterrestrials. It can be the seed, the, the seeding by um, meteorites and sure, and, sure, uh, okay, and comets, etc. So they have found the ingredients of life, the organic materials uh, in those in the comets. And so it's it's could be it could be. Although uh, our our planet is in reality, I mean, it's it's. The it's abundance so diverse, of life, it's so diverse, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing and difficult to explain. Yeah, I, I concur. Uh, <clears throat> the deception part, it's difficult to me to, um, to, to debate that because uh, we would have to consider, for example, Fatima 
I can relate to that. The Fatima apparition of 1917, in my opinion, was a UFO event. I've created two films on this. I'm going to show you first what happens at Fatima, um, and, and you'll see just the the adoration and the worship of Mary. So there's a disclaimer here, there's a caveat that you need to know, that we never talk about Mary, we never talk about people's belief systems or Catholicism or any of that. We don't attack that. that that's not what we're about. What we do drill into is the handwritten documents from 1917, where witness after witness looked up and saw a dull silver disc. I'm not making this stuff up. Here's a clip from our film, Fatima. The reason why I'm going to show you this is because this film is the only film that I'm aware of that actually shows the original glass plates taken by photographer Joshua Benoliel in 1917. And it clearly shows, in my opinion, a disc-like object hovering over the apparition site. Here's the clip. <laughs> And, and, you, uh, and you and I worked on, on our Fatima. films on Fatima, right. Um, the greys, I can eventually relate to that. The um, tall whites, the Nordics, it's a little bit different. A little different. Okay. Um, eventually, crop circles could be a deception. Crop circles, extremely enigmatic. No one knows really who is making them or why. They've been on the planet for hundreds of years. And we still really don't know who is behind it and what the message they're trying to convey to us. As a supernaturalist, I believe that there's a supernatural explanation. Perhaps the authors of these things are interdimensional beings which have been visiting us for thousands and thousands of years. I find it interesting that whoever is doing it, many crop circles are found next to megalithic ancient sites like we see all over England. It's not a deception. No. It's just there. It is what it is. It is what it is. Um, Skinwalker Ranch, it is what it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cat and Mouse, Skinwalker Ranch, the entity does not want to stare. And the Indians know, knew for centuries that that was something that they would not go there. Okay? Um, so it's not a deception. You just don't have to mess with it. Okay? So. There could be different realities, different interpretations. It's it's difficult to say. I I, I don't know. I, I wish I could know, but eventually we are limited to some some sort of. Um, Richard Dolan wrote the book, you know, AD after, after disclosure. Um, fascinating book, and and, I, and he nails it because uh, when when they show up in force, let's say it's just not one mile wide craft; it's several. And there's a bunch of scout ships running all over the place and they're making crop circles and whatever but the bottom line is if we have that and the cameras are trained on it everything changes the entire world as we know it changes in a, in a nanosecond collapses yeah everything <laughs> collapses everything collapses not only the panic that was demonstrated in several experiments, Orson Welles, etc. That was replicated in several other at, um, uh, radio stations across the world. World rules, right? Off rules. Um, <clears throat> but then uh, economics. I mean, the the um, stock market would go down. <laughs> uh, 
we have a new form of energy, new technology, so everything that we, the companies have been researching is put aside, so it will be the collapse, at least of the Western world. Yes, maybe the Indians in the Amazon or in Africa will not notice, but we will face a uh, <coughs> collapse. It's a massive paradigm shift. Everything, massive just, paradigm shift. everything just changes. You know, there's a lot of channelers and new agers mm -hmm who are channeling entities, and of course I believe that, that these entities are demonic. I mean, it's just, it's just that's my worldview. They're saying that the event this of disclosure is going to happen soon, but they've been saying this for years. Exactly. For 40 years. Yeah. You know? yeah. One so, day they will, yeah. they will be <laughs> right. But they, yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> and it's, no, it's, it's, uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Things are, are forwarding to a, a path I, and I'm worried about the path of the threat. Um, that's not a tip. Oh, it became initially with Bigelow uh, Pass, Bigelow Advanced, uh, uh, Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies. Then, when there was this uh, funding from uh, the American Congress, it's it changed for OSAP, Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program. And then, to justify more funding and to keep the, the, the congressman uh, interest, they changed it for threat, yeah? ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. So, yeah, and, and Luis Elizondo has been talking about the threat, uh, not Commander Fravor. Commander Fravor, yeah, Fravor yeah. Uh, he he uh, he's, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's just um, amazed by all the capabilities of this advanced aerospace vehicles, as he called them, but um, yeah, uh, nowadays Tom DeLong, Luis Elizondo are talking about threat. Where do you think all this is headed? I mean, we're in the fifth rung of a disclosure ladder. I, I really thought that, um, in, in my opinion, before you answer, in, in my opinion, I think that um, this is a scenario footage from Roswell, where they're showing a debris, because you know there are cameras there. They're yeah. showing a debris field. They're showing the saucer that's left of it. They're showing the retrieval of alien, so-called alien bodies. Maybe they're actually, maybe one of the entities are alive and they're, and they're showing that. What are your thoughts? I hope so. Now, that will be a real big step, I think. And uh, yeah. I'm still a little jaded because I've waited so long for it. Waited this. so long, it's been decades. And uh, I'm kind of disappointed at, at just seeing films. I want to see actual craft. But if they can release that, that will, I think, be the thing that wakes people up. To. Is that the tipping point? Yeah, that's going to be, I mean, it already is ma mainstream now. Yeah, it is. But if that happens, it will be taught in schools. There will be classes about UFO history right. in, in colleges and high schools. And there already is in some. Uh, so this subject is finally getting some serious attention and that will do it. And I can't wait because there's not only the Roswell footage, there's gun camera footage. There's a UFO that landed at Air Edwards Air Force Base. Right, right. I want to see that footage. Rendlesham Forest. Right. Or the 1954 meeting with Eisenhower. <laughs> That's real, and I think it probably is. Yeah, I, I think it is too. Because yeah. the more information, and you know, more research that goes into this continues to corroborate it. Thanks so much for watching the second free film in our ongoing series about UFO disclosure. Folks, I wanna uh, set the record straight here. We are now, as of April 7th, 2022, on the sixth rung of the disclosure ladder. The first rung happened in 2017 when Commander David Fravor appeared on the Tucker Carlson show and admitted right on air, right on live TV, I about fell out of my chair, that the UFO phenomenon that was not only real and the tic-tac shaped object that he encountered that flew away at, uh, at basically like a bullet out of his gun, Fravor's words, not mine. He stated on the record that whatever this was, was not of this earth. That's huge. The second rung on the ladder was when Luis Elizondo appeared once again on Tucker Carlson's show and admitted 
that we have in our possession metal from crashed UFOs, which was about to be tested. Incredible. Tucker asked, where does it come from? He said some of it came from the government. Other parts or the other parts of the metal over debris from crashed UFOs came from private uh, private people. So he was kind of kind of edgy and really didn't uh, spill the beans, as it were. The third rung on the ladder also appeared on Tucker Carlson and stated they tested the metal and the results showed alloys, isotopes not found on this earth. The fourth run on the disclosure ladder, when the Pentagon announced that we have, the United States has in its possession, vehicles not made on this earth. Folks, that's an unbelievable statement. The fifth run on the disclosure ladder is when our government released this nine-page report. Of course, when they talked about cow flatulence, it was almost pages, thousand. right? But UFOs, probably the greatest um, discovery or the greatest revealing of all of history, pretty much, uh, basically nine pages. And out of that, they said, well, out of the 143 cases that they looked at, 142 became, were unexplained. They had no answer to them. That is incredible. Finally, the sixth wrong where we find ourselves right now, and I never thought we would see we're this, here. But we're here. It happened on, on Brett Baer's report just a few days ago. And in that report, he states, Brett Baer states, that the Pentagon talks about unexplained pregnancies from people who have been abducted by UFOs. Folks, it's real. It's absolutely real. And they are unveiling this step by step, or to use the analogy, rung by rung by rung, up the ladder we go to full disclosure. unlike any other book on this planet. Most of you know it as the Bible. And the moment I say that word, some of you cringe back. I get that. I call it the guidebook to the supernatural because in fact, that's really what it is. There are prophecies from the first book to the last book, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Those prophecies speak out and call with great specificity events in the future. There's no other book like it. That begs the question, someone is outside of space-time as we know it, calling out the end before the beginning and the beginning before the end, just like prophecy tells us he will. The bottom line is this, we are in 
a cosmic war. Some of you may or may not believe that. These ships that just appear and then disappear, that defy the laws of physics, that manipulate space, time, matter, and energy. What are we looking at here? The guidebook of the supernatural tells us exactly what we're looking at here. These are, in my opinion, the fingerprints of the supernatural, the fingerprints specifically of the dragon. He's coming back for a last stand. This is why I call it the coming great deception of a Luciferian endgame. So you say, okay, LA, well, I've been abducted, I've been taken, how do I stop it? You just ask. You ask and you receive. You believe on the one who was sent here. His name is Jesus. You ask him into your heart. It's very simple. There's no magic formula. You just ask him. And then you pray. You say, you know, Father, I've, I've done stuff in my life that I'm not proud for. Please come in and change it. If you're being taken, go to him. Cry out to him and say, Father, please stop this. I don't want this in my life. In the name of Jesus, please stop it. Invite him in. It happened to me over 40 years ago, and my life has never been the same, and more than likely never will be again. And I thank God for that. Again, it's not religion, it's a relationship with the Son of God and the Father through the power of the Spirit of a living God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. It's available to you, all you have to do is ask. If this resonates with you in any way, shoot me an email, la at lamarzulli.net. Give me your phone number, I'll call you up and pray with you over the phone. But you don't need me to do that. You can invite him right here, right now. He has the power to stop all this stuff because he is the king. And the king is going to return. And many of us believe that return is soon. Thanks for watching. Remember, pass it forward.